EMD presents 710 series engine power assembly changeup. Unit assembly preparation. Prior to installation, the new power assembly must first be prepared. When delivered, both the blade rod and fork rod power assembly may be delivered in a cardboard and or wooden crate or a reinforced metal container. The metal container is designed for reuse while the cardboard packaging and wood crate are disposable. Follow local procedures for reusing or disposing of containers. All required gaskets, seals, and hardware are included in the shipping container. Remove the nuts and bolts from the wooden block that secures the assembly to the container. Also remove the bolt and wooden block holding the piston and set both blocks, bolts, and nuts aside for reuse. Block the injector well using a clean rag to prevent debris from entering the injector hole. Apply the lifting clamp to the rocker arm studs and secure the lifter. Remove the clean rag from the injector well. Apply and secure the piston holding tool to hold the piston and rod assembly at the top of the liner. Using an overhead hoist, lift the piston holding tool and lock the piston and rod assembly at the top of the cylinder liner. With the overhead hoist attached to the rear eye of the lifting clamp in preparation of application to the engine, lift the power assembly away and remove the protective plastic bag over the liner and dispose of properly once the assembly has been lifted from the container. A gasket kit, lower basket bolts, and basket halves are included in the shipping container. If the power assembly contains a fork rod, it is important at this time to check that the serial numbers of the connecting rod and connecting rod basket match. Note, serial numbers must match. Apply a connecting rod positioning clamp far enough up on the connecting rod so that when lifted, the rod does not strike the lower cylinder liner skirt. Remove the protective cover from the water inlet tube opening. Inspect the water discharge elbow to ensure the seal grooves are damage free. If any are damaged, discard the elbow and replace it with a qualified one. Carefully remove the two black and one red water discharge elbow seals from the gasket kit. Apply a light coat of Dow 4 silicone grease or equivalent to the seal grooves on the elbow and the two black seals, applying them to the grooves entering the crankcase. Apply a light coat of Dow 4 silicone grease or equivalent to the internal seal groove and to the red seal and apply this seal to the groove between the discharge elbow and the cylinder head. Tap the elbow in place with a plastic mallet if necessary and bolt the water discharge elbow to the head and torque to 30 foot-pounds, 41 newton meters. With the overhead hoist, raise the assembly high enough to apply the two lower liner seals and the head seat ring. Remove the two lower liner seals from the gasket kit. These seals may be marked EMD VIT and with red paint. Apply a light coat of Dow 4 silicone grease or equivalent to the lower liner seal grooves and the two lower liner seals and apply them to the liner. Locate and apply the head seat ring, ensuring the chamfered side of the ring with the word top stamped on the surface is facing up. Slide the ring over the liner and hang it on the head at an angle to hold it in position while the assembly is being lowered into the engine. Pre-lubricate the liner bore per EMD Locomotive Service Release 424-J and 103-Z for PM&I applications. The power assembly is now prepared for application to the engine. Crankcase and crankshaft inspection. Whenever the main or connecting rod bearings are removed, the crankshaft journal should be inspected for signs of distress, scoring, and cracks. The journals of the crankshaft are induction hardened. Excessive heat resulting from lack of lubrication or insufficient bearing clearance will usually produce thermal cracking. No attempt should be made to grind out signs of distress or scoring on the crankshaft journals as this has proven to be unsuccessful and could result in major crankshaft failure. Wipe the connecting rod journal of the crankshaft and inspect for any evidence of scoring, signs of distress, or thermal cracking. 
Also, inspect the air box and the oil pan for debris and clean as necessary. Inspect and clean the head pod area for any signs of cracking. An inspection of the replaceable cast iron lower liner bore insert is recommended at this time. This insert provides the wear surface between the lower cylinder liner seals and the crankcase that prevent air passage between the insert and the liner. If excessive wear is found, the insert should be removed and a new insert applied prior to the application of the new unit power assembly. Refer to the EMD 710 engine maintenance manual for insert removal and application procedures. Installation of unit assembly. Upon completion of the air box, crankcase, and crankshaft inspection, proceed with the installation of the unit power assembly. Ensure the crab bolt thread protectors are in place. Using an overhead hoist, slowly lower the assembly into the bore of the crankcase. Before the head contacts the crankcase, check to ensure that the head seat ring is in the proper position. As the assembly is lowered into the bore, line up the water discharge elbow with the mating hole of the crankcase. Care must be taken to prevent damage to the seals or twisting in the grooves as the head is lowered into position. Once the head is seated and the assembly is in place, move the overhead hoist from the lifting clamp, attaching it to the piston holding tool. Installation of unit assembly containing a blade rod. If the power assembly being applied contains a blade rod, disengage the locking sleeve and slowly lower the piston and blade rod assembly. Ensure that the long toe of the slipper foot is facing inboard or towards the center of the engine. Stop lowering the piston and blade rod when the slipper foot is about to reach the journal. Coat the inner and outer surfaces of the new upper bearing shell with oil and position it on the connecting rod journal. Holding the bearing in place, slowly guide and lower the connecting rod until the slipper foot rests on the bearing surface. Disconnect the overhead hoist, remove the lifting clamp and the piston holding tool, and place a clean rag into the injector well. This will prevent dirt or other loose objects entering the cylinder before the injector is applied. Remove the connecting rod positioning clamp from the blade rod. If the fork rod support tool was used, thread the piston holding tool into the piston crown of the opposite bank fork rod and piston assembly. Attach the overhead hoist and raise the fork rod and piston assembly so that the fork rod assembly support can be removed. While holding the upper bearing shell in place, bar the engine in the opposite direction of operation so that the opposite bank fork rod is at approximately 120 degrees after top dead center to position the crank pin for fork rod application. Installation of unit assembly containing a fork rod. These additional steps apply if the unit power assembly being installed contains a fork rod. With the blade rod resting on the new upper bearing shell, slowly lower the piston and fork rod assembly with the piston holding tool. Ensure that the serial numbers stamped on the rod just above the serrations are facing outward. Continue to slowly lower the holding tool, guiding the connecting rod until it can be positioned over the slipper foot of the blade rod. Ensure the locating dowels on the fork rod enter the bearing shell without binding as the rod rests on the bearing surface. Disconnect the overhead hoist, remove the lifting clamp and the piston holding tool, and place a clean rag into the injector well. This will prevent dirt or other loose objects entering the cylinder before the injector is applied. Remove the connecting rod positioning clamp from the fork rod. Locate the outside or dowel half of the fork rod basket, ensuring that the serial numbers stamped on the fork rod and basket half match. Apply a new lower connecting rod bearing shell to the basket half so that the dowels enter the dowel holes in the shell without binding and coat the bearing shell with oil. Using Texaco Thread Tex number 2303 or the equivalent, lubricate all upper basket bolt threads, thrust faces, and washers. Apply the basket half and lower bearing shell to the connecting rod journal while maintaining the same relative upright position to prevent dropping the bearing shell or basket into the oil pan. While supporting the lower connecting rod bearing and basket half, 
Start the upper basket to rod bolts by hand. Tighten the bolts just enough to mate the serrations of the fork rod and basket half to hold the bearing in place. Now, apply the inboard basket half to the connecting rod journal with the lubricated basket to rod bolts and washers. Hand tighten the bolts just enough to mate the serrations of the fork rod and basket half. Apply the lower basket bolts, washers, and self-locking nuts and tighten to 10 plus or minus 5 foot-pounds or 14 plus or minus 7 newton meters. Snug the upper basket to rod bolts to approximately 10 foot-pounds or 14 newton meters to firmly mesh the serrations. Give each of the upper basket bolt washers the finger tightness check by trying to rotate the washers. If a washer can be rotated when a twisting effect is applied with a finger grip, the bolt assembly should be removed to determine the cause of not clamping. To determine if the basket has been properly applied, visually inspect the position of the basket strap. Ensure that the basket is not resting on the bronze of the top of the bearing shell or on the raised section of the lower bearing shell. Once it has been determined that the basket has been properly installed, torque the upper basket bolts to 190 foot-pounds or 258 newton meters. Using a torque wrench and a spring-loaded basket bolt wrench, torque the three lower basket bolts to 75 foot-pounds or 102 newton meters. Completion of Unit Assembly Installation now that the basket bolts have been torqued, we can proceed with the completion of unit power assembly installation. Remove the crab bolt thread protectors and inspect the crab nuts, washers, and crabs to ensure that they are free of all burrs. Using Texaco Thread Tex number 2303 or the equivalent, lubricate all exposed crab bolt threads and both sides of the washers. And manually seat the nuts while moving the crab bolts back and forth. Before final torque is applied to the crab nuts, check that the crabs are positioned so a socket can be applied to the head-to-liner stud nuts. With the use of the hydraulic torque machine, or tame wrench, and after manually seating the crab nuts, apply an initial torque of 400 foot-pounds, or 542 newton meters. Position the hydraulic output device over the drive socket on the crab nut being torqued. Set the hydraulic torquing machine to low torque and engage until the specified torque is achieved. Adhere to manufacture and shop operating and safety procedures. Torquing the outboard crab nuts first and then the inboard nuts. It is important to note that on any one crab plate, do not torque the inboard nut to 400 foot-pounds or 542 newton meters until the outboard nut has been torqued to 400 foot-pounds or 542 newton meters. Once the initial torque has been applied to the crab nuts, the torque on the head-to-liner stud nuts must be checked. Remove the output device and the drive sockets of the tame wrench, and starting with the pilot stud, torque to 240 foot-pounds or 325 newton meters using the head-to-liner stud nut tightening sequence. Never final torque the head-to-liner nuts until after initial torque has been applied to the crab nuts. Again, with the use of the hydraulic torque machine or tame wrench, final torque the crab nuts to 2,400 foot-pounds or 3,254 newton meters. The crab nuts on the adjacent assemblies that were previously loosened must also be torqued at this time. Now position the hydraulic output device over the drive socket on the crab nut being torqued. Torquing the outboard crab nuts first and then the inboard nuts, Set the hydraulic torquing machine to medium torque and engage until the specified torque is achieved. Adhere to manufacture and shop operating and safety procedures. Again, it is important to note that on any one crab plate, do not final torque the inboard nut until the final torque has been applied to the outboard nut. Following crab bolt torquing, Remove all excess thread text number 2303 or equivalent lubricant from all crabs, crab bolts, and washer surfaces. Install the overspeed trip assembly on engines equipped with mechanical unit injectors, MUI, and torque to 24 foot-pounds or 32 newton meters. 
The injector and rocker arm assembly of both the new cylinder as well as the opposing cylinder opposite bank can now be applied. Remove the clean rag from the injector well in the head. Remove the applicable MUI or EUI injector for your application from the injector holder and wipe clean with the rag. Install the applicable unit injector into the tapered well in the cylinder head, checking that the locating dowel is seated properly and that the injector is centered between the valves. Place the injector crab over the injector crab stud and lubricate the threads with Texaco Thread Tex number 2303 or the equivalent. Place the spherical side of the washer into the spherical seat of the crab. Apply and snug down the injector crab nut. On engines equipped with mechanical unit injectors, MUI, check to ensure that the injector crab is not cocked at an angle that would prevent the use of the injector timing gauge, EMD, part number 8034638. Torque the injector crab nuts on either the MUI or EUI to 50 foot-pounds or 68 newton meters. On engines equipped with mechanical unit injectors, MUI, Reapply the injector control lever and adjusting linkage to the cylinder head. Line up the injector linkage clevis with the injector control shaft and apply the clevis pin and spring retainer clip. The fuel lines on the mechanical unit injector, MUI, can now be connected to the injector and the fuel manifold. To prevent possible fuel leakage, care must be taken not to scratch or nick the spherical seats used on some fuel line ends. Torque the fuel line to 40 foot-pounds or 54 newton meters. On engines equipped with EUI, electronic unit injectors, to help hold in place and prevent binding during installation, apply a light coat of Dow 4 silicone grease or the equivalent to the two new fuel jumper line O-rings. Place one in each O-ring land of the supply and return fittings of the fuel manifold. While standing at the side of the engine facing the injector, Loosely connect the supply or left fuel jumper line to the top rail of the fuel manifold and the return or right fuel jumper line to the bottom rail. It is imperative that a minimum clearance of 1 8 inch or 3.2 millimeters be maintained between all operating mechanisms and the fuel jumper lines. If any clearance is to be found to be less, the jumper line must be repositioned before tightening. Using a three-quarter inch wrench to hold the hex of the fuel jumper line in position, tighten the hex swivel nut with a 15 16 inch wrench. Torque each jumper to the specified value. It is also imperative that the fuel jumper lines are not kinked or twisted during application. Next, apply the rocker arm support brackets. A light tap with a hammer may be required to seat the rocker arm supports to the head and their locating pins. For safety reasons and uniformity of assembly, apply the valve bridge assemblies with a protruding boss and oil passage plug facing the camshaft. Taking care is not to drop the rocker arms, remove the rocker arm assembly from the designated container or basket and position over the rocker arm shaft studs and seat onto the support brackets. After making sure that all contact surfaces are clean and free from burrs, Apply the rocker arm shaft caps with the short toe facing inboard or as stamped. Lubricate the shaft stud threads with Texaco Thread Tex number 2303 or the equivalent. Apply the hardened washers and nuts to the shaft studs. Alternating from side to side, initially torque the shaft nuts to 150 foot pounds or 203 newton meters on the first pass and to a final torque of 300 foot pounds or 407 newton meters. Locate a new gasket from the gasket kit and apply the rocker arm oil supply line to the camshaft bearing block and torque the bolts to 7 foot-pounds or 9.5 newton meters. On engines equipped with EUI injectors, after the installation of the rocker arm assembly is complete, once again, check that a minimum clearance of 1 8 inch or 3.2 millimeters be maintained between all operating mechanisms and the fuel jumper lines. If any clearance is to be found to be less, the jumper line must be repositioned. On engines equipped with EUI injectors, carefully unfold the injector wires and reconnect the two solenoid wires with eyelet terminals to the injector. Connect and tighten the cable tie bracket to the cylinder head 
and position the wires properly to avoid contact with the fuel jumper lines and valve bridges. Next, the water inlet tube can be installed. Removing the tube from the designated container or basket, check to ensure that the seal groove and saddle clamp surfaces are clean and free from any nicks or burrs to prevent possible water leaks. Obtain a new water manifold saddle clamp gasket and liner to tube seal from the gasket kit that was shipped with the new unit power assembly. Apply the seal to the water inlet tube after applying a light coat of Dow 4 silicone grease or the equivalent. Position the saddle straps around the water manifold and through the inlet tube flange and apply the nuts finger tight. Once the strap nuts have been applied, check to see that the liner to tube seal is in place and finger tighten the bolts to the liner. Take the new water manifold gasket and shape it to fit over the manifold. Insert the gasket between the manifold and the water inlet flange, making sure that the sides of the gasket are flush with the sides of the flange and that the gasket ends are within the clamping radius. Using a suitable torque wrench, torque the four saddle strap nuts holding the tube to the water manifold 15 foot-pounds or 20 newton meters. Prior to torquing the liner to tube bolts, remove the tube bolts from the flange. If the tube moves, it must be repositioned on the water manifold. If no movement is detected, the liner to tube bolts and washers can be reapplied and torqued to 30 foot-pounds or 41 newton meters. Remove the new piston cooling pipe gasket from the gasket kit and apply it to the piston cooling pipe. Position the pipe onto the piston cooling oil manifold and place the nozzle end of the pipe into the lower liner so that the locating dowels on the pipe align with the dowel holes of the liner. If the bolt holes on either flange do not line up, replace the pipe. Under no circumstances should the pipe be bent to try to align it to the flanges, as this would place stress on the pipe which could result in subsequent failure. Torque the bolts 20 foot-pounds or 27 newton meters. Unlike previous model EMD engines, the alignment of the piston cooling pipe on GB series engines does not require the use of an alignment gauge. This is because the oil tube itself extends into the carrier when the cylinder being checked is at bottom dead center. To check the proper alignment of the piston cooling oil pipe, bar the engine over to bottom dead center of the cylinder being checked. At this point, there should be no binding of the nozzle of the cooling tube and the inlet hole of the piston carrier. If any interference exists, which indicates misalignment, the tube must be replaced. To provide the necessary information to evaluate the amount of subsequent wear or change in head-to-piston relationship, a lead reading must be performed after installing a new power assembly. Using a sufficient length of 1 8 inch lead wire, EMD part number 8243661, form it to the same contours of a piston of the same diameter as the cylinder being checked. Make sure that the lead wire is cut so that the ends of the wire are at least 1 8 inch or 3.18 millimeters from the outside diameter of the piston. Bar the engine over until the cylinder being checked is at bottom dead center. Using needle nose pliers, insert the formed lead onto the top of the piston being checked through the liner ports and position the lead so that it's parallel with the crankshaft. Once the lead has been applied, bar the engine one complete revolution until the cylinder is once again at bottom dead center. Carefully remove the lead wire from the top of the piston through the liner ports. Using a zero to one inch micrometer or vernier caliper, Measure the thinner of the two compressed areas of the ends of the lead wire to determine the minimum piston-to-head clearance. The difference in readings between the two measurements of the compressed ends should be within the minimum maximum micrometer reading of five thousandths of an inch or 0.13 millimeters for new, requalified, or otherwise clean remanufactured parts. If the reading is greater than the allowable tolerance, Repeat the process as the lead wire may have changed position during the initial procedure. Due to carbon buildup on both the fire face of the cylinder head and the crown of the piston, lead wire readings should not be used as a basis for power assembly changeout. To indicate wear trends, 
lead wire readings may continue to be used and only when significant clearances increase should possible component failures be investigated. Wipe out cylinder test valve bore and install a new style test valve seal into the bore of the engine. Lubricate the threads of the test valve body with a high temperature thread lubricant and screw the valve body into the head. Tighten the valve body and install the needle valve. Injector timing and adjusting hydraulic lash adjusters. Injector timing and hydraulic lash adjuster adjustments are crucial before a locomotive is returned to service. A poorly timed injector can result in problems such as poor fuel economy, loss of horsepower, excessive carbon buildup, and even turbo failure. Defective or improperly set lash adjusters cause the exhaust valves to be subjected to increased stress, which will lead to ultimate failure and probable engine damage. Referring to the timing plate located on the right side of the engine, rotate the engine in the normal direction of operation until the flywheel pointer indicates in degrees the correct position of the crankshaft relative to top dead center of the cylinder being timed. In this position, adjustments to the injector timing as well as hydraulic lash adjusters are done. On engines equipped with MUI, mechanical unit injectors, and with the injector rocker arm adjusting screw lock nut loose, insert the injector timing gauge EMD part number 8034638 into the hole provided for it in the injector body. Turn the adjusting screw until the shoulder of the timing gauge just passes over the injector follower guide. Tighten the adjusting screw lock nut while holding the adjusting screw in position. It is important to note that if the overspeed has tripped, it must be reset and the engine barred one full revolution before the injectors can be timed. On engines equipped with EUI electronic unit injectors and with the lock nut on the injector rocker arm adjusting screw loose, Turn the adjusting screw down or clockwise until the screw and injector bottoms. Next, back off the injector screw counterclockwise one and one half turns. While holding the adjusting screw in position, tighten the adjusting screw lock nut. On both exhaust valve bridges with the lock nuts of the rocker arm adjusting screws loose, turn the adjusting screws down until the last valve stem touches the lash adjuster. Use a one thousandth of an inch feeler gauge so that it's just snug between the valve stem and the top of the adjuster plunger. Remove the feeler gauge and turn the adjusting screws another one and one half turns. While holding the adjusting screw in position, snug the adjusting screw lock nut. Check to ensure that the valve bridge spherical seats are spring loaded against the head spherical seats. If the valve bridge spherical seats are not spring loaded, and are loose against the head spherical seats, turn the adjusting screw down another one quarter turn until there is no movement felt in the valve bridge. Once it has been determined that the valves are not being held open by the valve bridges, tighten the adjusting screw lock nuts holding the adjusting screw in position. The final step in adjusting the hydraulic lash adjusters is to check the clearance between the lash adjuster bodies and the top of the valve stems. The Lash Adjuster Minimum Clearance Gauge, EMD, part number 8107788, should fit between the lash adjuster body and the top of the valve stem to ensure that a minimum clearance of 1 16th of an inch is achieved. Note, if minimum clearance is not achieved, replace the power assembly. Refill the engine cooling system with preheated water if available. Perform an airbox inspection prior to startup to ensure that there is no debris in the adjacent assemblies, airbox, or manifold screen, and check for water leaks once the engine has been started. After inspecting the top deck cover seal for damage, position the cover onto the head frame and secure the holding clips and hinges. Check handhold cover seals and check for damage. Apply all handhold covers, and after barring the engine one complete revolution, close all cylinder test valves. Set all applicable switches and circuit breakers or valves to on. Start the engine and perform final checks according to standard operating procedures.